So in the continuation of our uh, topic on uh, pairwise alignment, so let's look at how does uh, how does this algorithm actually works to uh, to align to find the optimum alignment of the sequences. So we they do that by first um, arranging the two sequences in a matrix. So as you can see here for this matrix. And now you have here your matrix with the, the score of each cell of the matrix. So the, the first column is the sequence, the score. So this is for the global alignment. So if you notice, the, the, the uppermost uh, left is zero, is that set as zero value. So these are fixed values for the global alignment. So minus two, minus four, minus six. So there is a penalty or a um, a decrease in the scores, which actually corresponds to the to the gap penalty scores minus two minus four minus six. So that's the gap penalty scores that you have. And now we will look at this. Um, uh, how how do we uh, populate the the rest of the cells with the values? So the population is basically uh, goes by this equation. So the, the score, which is what the score that we will input in this particular cell is which among these um, calculations or calculated values is the maximum. So the score is the maximum the maximum of these uh, functions, basically. So you have this FIJ. So basically here is the, the calculation here. So the score for this, the first line, which is the diagonal, diagonal upper, upper left, uh, slide. So this is the, the score in the upper diagonal plus your score, which is a, is it a match? Is it a mismatch? So there's a score with, um, this the score, the, 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 the value here plus a score, whether it's a match or a mismatch. And the, the next line would be the gap penalty. So it's, it starts from I minus one J. So immediately above it and minus the gap, the score here minus the gap penalty. The, 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 the third line is the one on the, on the left side. So this is the score here minus the gap penalty. Because here, why is it the gap penalty? Here is basically when we, uh, when we considered uh, using the, the sequence here, it means we are introducing a gap in the sequence. The same goes for this one. Now let's look at uh, the scores for this example. So the first um, line is F versus F. So we have here the score on the diagonal, which is zero, plus is it a match or a mismatch? So since both of them are F, so it's considered a match. So the, the reward for a match is a plus one. So the score for the first line is zero plus one. So that's a positive one. Now let's look at the, the second line. So the, the, the one immediately above, the, 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 the value in the cell immediately above is negative two minus the gap penalty, which is negative two minus two minus two is minus four. And then for the one on the left, the, the value in the left side is negative two minus two which is the, the gap penalty also. So minus two minus two is minus four. So now the score here would be the highest between positive one, negative four, and negative four. So the highest is positive one. So that will be the score that we will be input here. Now moving on to the next uh, next cell in the in the row. So the same, uh, the same method, you will look at the diagonal and whether it's a match or a mismatch. So the diagonal here is minus two. It is between M and F. So it's a mismatch. So there's a mismatch penalty of minus two. So you have a minus, uh, minus two minus it's negative four. And then we look at this one above. So the one above, the score above here is minus four, minus the gap penalty which is minus two, so it's negative six. And the one on the left side, so the, the, the value here is positive one. It's the value of the, the value that we input before. So it's positive one minus the gap penalty because this one is on the left. So minus, minus uh, positive one minus two, that's negative one. So what is the highest value between negative one, negative four, and negative six? So that means it's a negative one. So we'll input the highest value.
value. So we will populate the whole um, matrix with the values going by our score matrix. So we, end, we will end up basically with this one. So input it, so on and so forth. So work it around. So that's why you need a computer to do this because it's very iterative and it's very uh, disastrous if you made a mistake on a single cell. It would affect all the rest. So here is when it is populated the whole way. So this is your um, whole, uh, basically fully populated matrices. So the, the one with the shaded regions, these are the matches. D with here, M and M, B and B. But that doesn't mean that even if we do have a match, that doesn't mean that this is the alignment that we would go for. So that depends on which would have the, the highest score when we add this scores here so how do we add the score so we move upwards from the from the lower right move upwards to uh, finding the 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 region where there is always the highest score so this is the region of alignment the diagonal lines the when we go horizontal we introduce a gap in sequence one this this one here when we go vertical we introduce a gap in sequence two so here are examples of the sequences that we have. So this is a purely horizontal line, so just GLMT. So all of them are properly aligned. So there is another alignment, that, but there's a difference between M and P. But still, the best sequence is aligning them properly. And then there is one, three versus four. So here, we introduced a gap because this provides us the, with the best alignment score. And the same with this one, we introduce a gap because it, this provides us with the best alignment score. So depending on the alignment score, uh, on that is based on how we will proceed with this uh, sequences. So that's actually how you do uh, the substitutions. Now, how do we know what score, what is the penalty match and mismatch? What is the match reward and the mismatch penalty score to give? So this is where scoring matrices comes comes in and scoring matrices is based on what you call the substitution models this is the nucleotide sub, uh, we start first with nucleotide substitution models because i believe this one is one of the first to be known so the nucleotide substitution uh, models they illustrate a multiple substitution at the same site or multiple hits so basically there we apply here the theory of evolution where we uh, supposed where we um, assume a general assumption of a an ancestral sequences that somewhere along the line it ha it changes it diverges into two sequences and these sequences have accumulated nucleotide sequences so you have here um for example here this sequence have diverged so this this sequence have diverged for example this t change to c and then to a and then this C changed to T, this A changed to G, then to C, this G uh, changed to A, then to G. So basically, this is substitutions. So we see substitutions here. So we have we can have multiple substitutions happening on the same side or single substitution like this one. We have parallel substitution where both change at the same time, at the same type of amino acid change. We have convergent substitutions where there are changes, but eventually the end point is uh, that it changed back to, it, they have the same, uh, the, the, the final product is they have similar or they have the same uh, nucleotides. The back substitution where it changed before, but it changed back. And so these are the, the possible scenarios that they have. So we can have as many uh, substitutions possible because we really don't know. Uh, this is based on what we have already seen as a product. We don't see the process, we just see the end product. So these are just uh, theories and suppositions. So we have uh, Markov models of substitutions where they applied a Markov uh, statistical models, the Markov, uh, Markov models for statistical significance. So we have several over the years. So the earliest one here are the JC69. That means it's made by Jokes and Cantor in way back 1969. And we have the Kimura, we have the Felsen. So these are basically the substitution models that were um, derived. Uh, they, they, they made 
they were uh, designed, uh, how do I say this? They were composed uh, based on rigorous assessments of the, the many different um, sequences, nucleotide sequences, comparisons. And these are the, the models that they come up with. So we won't be discussing each and every one of them, but when you look at substitution models, we usually look we usually uh, see them as one of the, the um, when we do optional parameters, for example, in BLAS, we usually see some of them. Uh, when we want to uh, modify some parameters, we are given the options on what substitution matrix to use. So we usually see them when we do that. And that is, though this is what this, um, uh, because basically it's just a sequence of can be JC69, HKY85, what does this mean? So this is basically what it means. So these are the initials of the authors and the date and the year they were published. Um, and, and so and that is your, uh, well, except for this one. So here is your, uh, some substitution matrices. So for example, uh, from T to T, so you have a value of lambda. So the, the the simplest one is the Jokesen Cantor, that's 1869. So they assign a value of lambda consistent through all. So as long as it changes, you have a single um, a single value change. But reality is not really like that because, for example, you have a purine and pyrimidine. So purine is technically different structurally from pyrimidine. And when we do have um, mutations, it is actually found even when you look at the damages in the DNA repair system. Purines to purines and pyrimidine to pyrimidine are the most common, are rather more common than we have transversion substitutions. So transitions and transversions. And that is where Kimura came by, where, where it, uh, there, is a, there is a differentiation, different values for a transition substitution versus a transversion substitution. Purine to pyrimidine, pyrimidine to purine. Is different has a different value versus purine to purine, pyrimidine to pyrimidine. And then we have the Fesselstein. So again, different values. This one specific for each value of nucleotide because it was found looking at homologous sequences among similar sp uh, species, uh, closely related species. There is a changes that, for example, um, C tend to change more to T than to A, or something like that. So there is that rates of substitution observed among uh, collections of sequences as we as we know learn mo many uh, more and more sequences we get there is uh, models like this that appear where they assign values to the score from the, the when it changed from t to a there's a there's a score when change from T to G, there's a different score based on the likelihood that of the amino acid T will change to C versus the amino acid T will change to G. So there is that um, that question. So that's basically uh, how these models came by. So here's what I was talking about. So relative substitution rates. So the simplest one is the Jokes and Cantor model. It's 1969, where if you look at this one, so the changes between them, they are the same. So they just use the same penalty scores. But for the K9, K80, if you look at this one, so the thickness of the nine, so there is the greater substitution rates between the purines and the pyrimidines versus the transversions. So the, the, that means you can assign smaller penalties for this substitution and greater penalties for this substitution. And then uh, as we go by, you have a more and more complicated um, scoring uh, scoring uh, rules here. For example, T to C, C to T, they do tend to change a lot. So they have a lo much lower and lower scores. And then the, the, the mutations A to G, not so much. Uh, that means, for example, here A tends to change more to T than to G. So there's a greater tendency for A to, to become T than to, for A to become G because of the thickness. And so they have uh, slightly different. So the scoring for T to A is slightly lower than the scoring from A to G. So basically that's that's how you do, uh, how this scoring matrices came about. That's a general idea. So this is for the nucleotides. Now, how about for the proteins? For the proteins, it's slightly more, no, actually not slightly, it's much more complicated because we have 20 amino acids to account for. And 
most of them also have similarities in uh, bi biochemical properties. And so we must be able to account for that in our scoring matrices, in how we score the mismatches and the, the matches and the mismatch between them. Okay, so we have here um, that the most common is uh, the Dayhoff. Uh, the first one basically is the Dayhoff substitution model by Margaret Dayhoff in 1978. So this is the this one provides the basis for a quantitative scoring system for pairwise alignments between any proteins. Uh, this is for the Dayhoff model. Actually, this is what you know as the PAM. This is the um, the initial beginnings of the PAM model, PAM substitution matrix. And then we have the Blossom by Stephen Hennikoff and George Hennikoff. And then we have the J, another one, the J, JTT model. So what are, uh, before we look much more closely on this uh, scoring matrices, so what are the types of models that we have? So here we have empirical models, which is the, the most commonly used. And this one is more of an attempt to describe the relative rates of substitution between amino acids without considering explicitly factors that influence the evolutionary process. So they are often constructed by analyzing large quantities of sequence data as compiled from database. So empirical models, they come from, um, the scores come from analyzing large amounts of sequences uh, from closely related to distantly related sequences. And the scores come from the observations on how, how often these certain amino acids become another amino acids down the line. And an example of that is a Dayhoff, which is what the, the precursor the progenitor for the PAM, and we also have JDT. So this is much more easier to know because especially now we have more data and we can just analyze the data. Then we have the mechanistic models. So the mechanistic model, they considered biological processes involved in amino acid substitution, such as mutation bias in the DNA, translation of the codons to amino acid and acceptance or rejection of the resulting amino acid after filtering by natural selection. Now, they do have much more interpretative power because there is an explanation why, for example, um, serine change to, um, let's see, uh, serine changed phenylalanine or tyrosine changed to phenylalanine. So there's a much more uh, reason for that. But there is a difficulty in doing mechanistic models, especially if we just uh, apply our uh, logic, because uh, our logic and understanding on this one, it might not exactly fit what is actually observed. And that is why empirical models are much more commonly used than the mechanistic models, because these empirical models are based on what is actually observed in actual data versus the mechanistic model, which is, we do have an explanation why it changed, but is it really observed? in the practical sense. So you have that. Okay, so let's look at the PAM substitution matrix, which is for some it's uh, default, but actually for BLAS is the blossom. But this is one of the most commonly used substitution matrix. So the first empirical amino acid substitution matrix constructed by Dayhoff and colleagues. In this one, they compiled and analyzed protein sequences available at that time. And uh, they used a person mean argument to reconstruct ancestral protein sequences and tabulating amino acid changes along branches of your phylogeny. So you have many different um, amino acids and they do uh, parsimonies. Uh, basically, parsimony tree is uh, basically constructing trees and uh, the branches indicates that the, the changes are uh, this one changed to A, this one changed to G, this one changed to E, something like that. So they are used to reduce the impact of multiple hits. The author used only similar sequences that were different from one another at less than 15% of the sites. So the inferred changes were merged across all branches without regard to their different lengths. So again, this substitution matrix was observed or rather was constructed by as an empirical method. So they use utilize many different sequences, although they are available at the time. And they are using homologous sequences, not and uh, very decently related, uh, not exactly that, uh, homologous sequences, closely related sequences, not different proteins of entirely different um, identities. For example, we don't, they don't use collagen and um, the sequence for collagen. And then a, a sequence for, uh, let's say, uh, globin, uh, and then incorporate them in that matrix because they are 
two different proteins. So they they use homologous proteins for creating the substitution matrix. Because why do we use homologous proteins? Based on the idea that they they have a single ancestral protein that uh, over the, the course of the evolution theory, theoretically, over the course of the theoretical evolution, it somehow changed. Uh, and the changes can be observed uh, but based on basically how often for example, A change to R versus A change to a different amino acid. So let's look at this one, for instance. Let's have it for, for a given example. So these are the green ones. These are the reward, the, the sorry, the rewards um, for matches. So even the rewards for the matches are different. So for example, C to C matches. So that means um, C tends to become, uh, say, not. Uh, conserved or not so conserved so if you have a higher uh, higher score so that means greater conservation so they for example uh higher the highest score so far here is the 12 which is for tryptophan w is tryptophan so because tryptophan rarely if ever change so if you notice among this one the changes for tryptophan it's mostly very reddish so the, the penalty is high for changes in tryptophan. So tryptophan tends to be conserved, and that's why we assign a higher value of five here. So what is the lowest among the, the match pen, match rewards? Four, is it four? Uh, four is the lowest. So serine, serine and alanine, they tend to be not so conserved much often. So they tend to change. As you can see here, the only red in the alanine is the phenylalanine, the tryptophan, and the tyrosine. But the rest, they have um, actually non -neg even non-negative changes. So saying that they, they do tend, uh, alanine tend to change to become uh, proline, uh, serine, or threonine, and even guanine. Ah, sorry. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's guanine. Ah, sorry, not guanine. What is G? Glycine. Glycine. Sorry, it's amino acid. I forgot. So glycine. So, so on and so forth. So here is the highest penalty. Higher penalty is negative 9. So they don't always change. For you. That means uh, that the changes is not often seen in the, the analyzed sequences. The W to E changes, they are not often seen. So you have this penalties. Uh, see here is also quite conserved. As you can see, they are very reddish, so they don't really want to change often, as often as the others do. So that is your uh, substitution matrix. So this is the score, match or mismatch score that you will input when you do the the sequence and uh, sequence alignment uh, matrix from before, where you have the three. You uh, you want to find. Um, uh, the value uh, in this in the matrix, you want to find the value um, which is the highest value, which uh, the diagonal plus the match or the mismatch penalty scores, the uh, the one at the top minus the gap penalty, the one on the left minus the gap penalty. So the the mismatch and the match scores, you will see it here. For the gaps, it's it tends to usually be a consistent as long as it's a gap, it's a consistent score. Now for the, again, the substitution, match or mismatch, the score, uh, the, the mismatch penalty and the match reward is based on this substitution matrix. And that's actually what the use of substitution matrix is for. Now here is the JTT matrix. So this one uses a similar approach to the Dayhoff model, but they use a larger collection. It's just, uh, the issue here is just the, the, the reference of um, the the number of protein sequences they, they reference to create this one. So of course they would be able to have different values. So you have these different values. So again, this is the same as WAG and MTMAM. So same um, same idea for the uh, the day off, but just different. If you notice, uh, different sets of protein sequences that they analyze. Now we have here the blossom matrix. So the blossom, usually see it in blast. 
So this is introduced by Steven Hennikoff and Georgia Hennikoff. So there are used to score alignments between evolutionary divergent protein sequences. They are based on local alignments. And that's why it's called a blossom, which means it's a block substitution matrix. So they have blocks database, which is a 500, greater than 500 groups of local multiple alignments. Of This one is a more decently related protein sequences. So that means uh, when you look at uh, the PAM and the blossom, which one to use. It's basically just boils down to which one of them to use, basically. PAM, because the, 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 the scores for PAM was derived from homologous, closely related sequences. So they tend to become used for homolo for finding, um, for scoring, or it's much more considered a reliable matrix, uh, rule of thumb, a more reliable matrix for using them in comparing sequences that are closely related. Whereas for the blossom matrices, these are for, um, again, they are observed from conserved regions. So even though they are decently related sequences, but this was done by uh, blocks of local alignment, locally aligned sequences. So we can find conserved regions, even if the sequences, the protein sequences are decently related, we can observe conserved regions on there. And um, basically, that, that is why blossom is that generally, but not always tend to be used for uh, comparing more distantly related sequences because uh, their original source of uh, deriving these uh, scores is from distantly related pro distant re related protein given that they are conserved regions local alignments conserve blocks region blocks conserve regions or blocks of local alignment but of distantly related proteins so you have the log adds ratio for each of the 190 substitution pairs of the 20 standard amino acids. So again, these are observed alignments. So they are not extrapolated from comparison of closely related proteins like the PAM matrices. So again, uh, the, the issue with the PAM matrices, uh, because they are more, uh, again, uh, there is also an, an extrapolation. Oh, in the PAM matrices. So blossom is the ten, uh, the default use in the BLAST matrices. Okay, now which one to use, the PAM or the blossom? And aside from that, there are numbers here, blossom 90, blossom 62, blossom 45, and then we have the PAM 30, PAM 180, PAM 250. So which is which? So in summary, high blossom PAM, uh, blossom, high value blossom matrices and low value PAM matrices are best suited to well conserved regions of your uh, DNA. So, uh, what does this uh, 45, the numbers mean? So, for example, in the blossom 45, so Blossom 45 matrix, all members of a protein family with greater than 45% amino acid identities are grouped together. So that means if you have um, a more uh, homologous or a more closely related sequences, the higher value for the blossom, the better. Because, uh, for example, blossom 90, that's 90% identities are grouped together. So that means highly conserved or highly similar um, protein families are grouped together to form the matrix. So that's blossom 90. That's why it's it's recommended for use on the less divergent or um, more closely similar or closely related sequences like the human versus chimpanzee beta globids. Now for the other side of the spectrum, we have the lower number blossom, which is they have a lower amino acid identity, similar identities of amino acids. And so they can be better much suited for distantly related sequences when we want to score distantly related sequences. Now the opposite is applicable for the PAM because the, the way the PAM numbers the, themselves is because PAM means point accepted mutations. So it's an extrapolation that means um, uh, PAM30 is accepted mutations after 30 substitutions. And then PAM250 is accepted mutations after 250 substitutions. So the more substitution, the more distantly related there are. So PAM250 is more suited to a more distantly related sequence compared to the PAM30, which is for a more closely related sequence. So that's the numbering between the PAM. Now, if you don't know which is which and you don't know if the two proteins are really homologous or not. We have the middle line, which is the blossom 62 or for, for PAM120, which is some more of, um, you don't really know if it's decently or closely related.
So that's the neutral stance on that one. So when in doubt, use Blowstone 62 and Pump 120. So that's it. Okay, now how do we get statistically? Um, we have these different scores and the values. How is it? How can we, what can we say about these scores and the values? So this is basically the um, uh, informations for determining significance. So alignments. So we have true positive, false positives, false negatives, and the true negatives. So here we have this uh, diagram or this um, table here. So sequences are homologous. And the alignment result is reported as related. So this is considered a true positive. But the, the homologous sequences, but the alignment result report it as not related. That's called a false negative. So this is the true value. This is the, the result of our alignment. So we tend to have true positive, false negatives. Then false positive, which are they are not homologous, but they are reported as similar. And true negatives, not homologous, not uh, negative uh, alignment results or related as not similar. So you actually see them as uh, way back in statistics. If you remember your bio statistics, you have uh, the true, true value, uh, false positives, and the false negative results. So what's the probability of getting a false negative? What's the probability of getting a false positive in these results? You, your, remember your alpha test, the beta test. We also have this one in alignment. Now, here is uh, your predictors for this one. So you have what you call sensitivity, specificity, and then uh, the term, uh, predicting the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. So from these values of true positives and the false uh, negatives, you can get sensitivity, which is the ratio of getting a true positive from all the um, A plus C, so from all the actual positive, the true positive score. So sensitivity is getting a true positive in all of the, the all positive scores. And specificity is getting a false, uh, a true negative in the set, set uh, of actually um, negative scores or all negative, or all of them are, are, are actually negatives. And what's the tendency of your test getting a true negative of them? That's your specificity. For the sensitivity, among all of these true results, what is the tendency of your test? to get the correct amount of, to get how many of these true positives can your test or can your tool detect and how many of these true negatives can your test detect. So that's basically your specificity and sensitivity. Now for the positive predictive value is uh, what is the possible probability of your uh, results, your so your tool getting a true positive among all of the results it as positive. For example, there are false positives in your tool's results, but how is the probability of getting a, a correct positive here? That's your positive predictive value. The negative predictive value is which is the tendency of your test to get a true negative among all of these uh, they considered as negative because there are also false negative in the test, which is true but considered as not true. So basically, among them, what is the tendency to get a true negative for the scores? So you have these uh, terms, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, specificity, and sensitivity. Now you have your um, alignment score. So how do we know? So for the global alignment, so consider aligning to proving sequences. And we get an alignment score. But... Oh, that's a numerical value. What exactly does that value score mean? So you have another test, you have a different score. So is it statistically significant? So the thing here is we can perform a statistical test, which is the z-test. So we have, we state that our hypothesis, the null is that the sequences are not related, and the, the alternative is that the sequences are not related. We have a significant value alpha. Now, since you have one score, how will you generate a sample? So, because the Z test will give uh, requires us to have more than one sample to actually do our test. So, how you generate a sample? Because you only have one score from one alignment. So, here is how to generate a sample. We tend to do bootstrapping here um, in order to get more than one, uh, more than one population 
a population of more than one. So these are some approaches. So we have a sequences where a large number of non-related proteins. We can generate random sequences and then compare it to your query, or we can just randomly scramble the, the sequences to get a set of non-similar sequences to compare to the query. However, since our Z test, our statistical test, um, postulates that we have a Gaussian curve, and this is not exactly um, the random sequences do not really generate a Gaussian curve. There is this a weakness to this statistical approach for the global alignment. And the actual answer to that is there really is not a, a universal, universally correct alignment. So we just tend to look at the score, compare it to a known uh, homologous score and see if it's closer or not. So basically that's, that's how we do that. Now, another way to look at this one is we can look at it in our percent identity. So how, well, which percent of your um, sequences have the same identity or identical um, uh, identical elements in your sequence? So these are the exact match. Now, in using percent identity, we must be cautious because for very closely related sequences, we can have scores as high as 90, 98, even 100 versus a more decently related, the usual score is 25, 30, 40%, less than half is similar, but it's considered a good, homo good homology already because uh, in reality, this is obtained from two decently related sequences. So basically, the, the thing here with your um, using percent identity, this is much, in my opinion, much less reliable. Uh, in fact, for getting your identity per identity percent, because this is more of uh, subjective. There's a degree of subjectivity in here. You need to decide whether your cutoff is 25, is it 30, or is it 40? And that is the reality in bioinformatics. Now, another one is the relative entropy, or the age of their target, and the background distribution measures. The information that's available per aligned amino acid position that, on average, distinguishes a true alignment from a chance alignment. So here is your um, the entropy. So it the entropy just means that you if you have a shorter sequences, you would you tend to have uh, a more widely variant um, sequence. So for example, I want to align conotoxins together, even though they they are they come from the same or very similar um, gene. Uh, gene families, if you look at their alignment, they are very, very low percent identity. And that is because they are very short and a single change has a huge impact. The same is true with very long. In a very long sequences, on the other hand, you need to have a, a large stretch of uh, differences to have an impact on the percent identity. So basically, in, in ter terms of entropy, the length is significant. So the entropy uh, gives us a value that is uh, that, uh, that accounts for the length of your uh, the sequences that you are comparing. So when you have greater lengths, so if you notice the, your relative entropy increases, if you have a minimum, uh, the significant less increases. So your relative ent ent entropy decreases, and you have your um, sorry, the relative entropy decreases if you have your significant lengths increasing. So there is a more stability if you have longer chains than you have shorter, shorter sequences. Because again, for shorter sequences, a small change can greatly affect the scoring if you look at your percent identity scores. So that's for statistical alignment. So uh, let's look at some um, local, before we end this uh, lecture, we look at some algorithms for pairwise alignment algorithms. So we have the BLAST from NCBI. We have S2 Genome. This is an EMBOSS program. Although this is from uh, the reference book here is a bit old. So some of them might not be uh, existing or might not be uh, functional again. But anyway, so these are some. But BLAST and TBI is usually the, the ones most commonly used and um, still functional.
So that's it for lecture one. Now, on the next lecture, which is on the last lecture, we will be discussing how to actually read the scores of your blast. Okay, so that's it.